I want to take you to a portion of scripture this morning, and I want to dive into that today because, uh, as always, I believe God wants to speak to someone's heart today. If you would open up your ears, that you would hear what God is saying and open up your heart to receive what he is wanting to speak to you today. If you had to choose, and I'm not saying this would be a, be something to have, but if you had to choose a book of the Bible, or let me put it that way, if you didn't, if I had to, let me put it on me for a second. If I had to choose a book of the Bible, they said, you know what, Joel, there's 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old, 27 in the New Testament, but total of 66. Uh, Joel, we have a problem. There's 66 books of the Bible, and um, uh, you have to choose one book. And that's the only book you could choose, and that's the book you have to have. If I had to do that today, um, you can make a case for every book in the Bible. Obviously, it's the Word of God. Every book comes from God. Every book is uh, God-breathed, as uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 3, says that the Bible is God-breathed. So every aspect of the Bible is God's Word. So you can't really say one is elevated higher than the other. It's kind of like trying to pick your favorite child. You know, every child is special. Every child is important to a parent. There's not one that's greater than the other. Uh, there's one that might have this personality, one maybe like this, but then they all have their strengths and their weaknesses. In Scripture, it's the same way. There is some uh, some uh, Scriptures that have so much depth and others that kind of be a more of a narrative story, but you can't really pick one over the other. It's all God's Word. How can you say any of God's Word is is no good. But for sake of argument today, if I had to choose one book of the Bible, and that's the only book of the Bible that I could have a copy of, I would speak, I would probably choose uh, the book of John. The book of John is absolutely, it is a lifelong study of the Bible. If you, if you want to know about Jesus, if you want to know about how, who God is and how he operates, the book of John is absolutely just so rich in the depth of who God is. And uh, I love it. I mean, I probably spent more time reading and diving through the book of John than any other uh, any other book. If you are a part of Antioch West, uh, you know that I have preached from the book of John so many times I can't even count. And that's just in the last uh, three or four years. That doesn't include anything else I've done in my 21 uh, years of ministry. So I'm going back today. Guess what? Shocker. I'm going back to the book of John again. I want to bring you again to a scripture that uh, for some of you, I've preached from this, I've spoken from this, I've talked from this, uh, but I want to bring back to you again today because I believe God brought this back to my attention this morning and I want to, uh, I want to show you something uh, in this passage of scripture that I believe can help you where you are. The Gospel of John is a unique book because uh, it tells us certain stories that we don't find in the other accounts of Jesus' life. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the four books they are called the Gospels. The Gospels speak of the life and ministry, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they're four unique books. Some tell one story. Sometimes you'll find a story in two books or three books. Uh, but there are several stories in the book of John that we do not find in any other Gospels. We don't find the story in John chapter 3 of a man by the name of Nicodemus. Uh, John chapter 4, Jesus talks to the woman at the well. We don't find that anywhere else. And in John chapter 5, we see this miracle take place that John gives us uh, in the depth of it. So I want to read it to you. I'm going to read out of what's called the New Living Translation because it has more of a, of a narrative storytelling tone to it. Uh, but John chapter 5, verse number 1 says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish, Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda. With five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. 30, I want you to get that, 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? And his reply was, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, 
stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, this is a fascinating story uh, from just the surface of that is the fascinating story of Jesus healing someone who had been lame for 38 years. I want you to just for a second work with me for a moment because sometimes I think the magnitude and length of time is lost in Scripture. There are portions of the Bible that a one or two sentences or maybe a chapter sums up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years. Think about how long 2020 has felt. On one standpoint, 2020 has felt long. On the other standpoint, I can't believe it's already the middle of October. But think about it. I mean, imagine if I said to you, sum up 2020 in two sentences. And someone would say, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. Many people suffered. And that was what would, you know, uh, a thousand years from now, someone wrote, uh, was reading a book and said, boy, in 2020, it was the year of a pandemic. Many people suffered. Wow, that must have been a tough, tough time. But can you really share or go through the depth of what 2020 has been like in a global crisis that we've been in and sort of the way our world has been completely flipped upside down? Can you really describe that in just a few sentences? So when we read the story and the first thing that sticks out to me is this guy had been sick for 38 years. We read that and go, yeah, 38 years. 38 years. I just recently turned 40 a month ago. And when I look at my life, I, would, I can't imagine basically that's the length of my life. Now, I know for those of you that are older, 40 is younger. For those of you, you that are young, 40 is old. So I guess technically I am officially middle-aged because to older people, I'm young. For young people, I'm old. I don't know what I am. So I guess technically 40 is you're getting in that middle-aged. But when you think about that, I can imagine in my lifetime having something that I've dealt with for 38 years. Uh, so it's like having something that started when I was two years old before I even really had any memories and I've dealt with that my entire life. So every memory, everything that I've been through in my life is is dictated and has become a, 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 a wrapped around this uh, condition I'm in. This wasn't just something that he had been dealing with for a few days. You know, I'll be frank with you, there's sometimes you go through something for a few weeks and it's like, oh, is this ever going to end? It feels like it's gone on forever. Sometimes you go through things that last for a year or two, and it feels like a lifetime. But think about this. To this guy, this more than likely was a lifetime. 38 years, I don't think he was that old. I don't know if he could have been a lot older than that. I mean, the life expectancy of someone during that period of time wasn't what it is today. So 38 years, it had to have been most of his life he was in this condition. So when we read that story and we read that sentence, one of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years, and... When Jesus saw him, he knew he'd been ill for a long time. Uh, we just kind of skip through that. We don't realize that's 38 years of 365. So let's hold on a second. I, I got it here. This is the beauty of having an iPad nearby. Uh, I'm not quite that good in math. So I will uh, have to uh, rely on a calculator. But let's just say 365 times 38 just for fun. So that's think about that. That is 13,000. 870 days times 24 that's 332,880 hours and that is 19 almost 20 million seconds of life 38 years 38 years is a long time to deal with something 38 years, over 13,000 days of this condition. This wasn't somebody who just happened to be going through something that he just stumbled in through. He was having a, a difficult time or, you know, he was having a rough year or maybe this was just a bad, bad time. This was somebody who had been going through something for over 13,000 days. When you think about it that way, it is staggering. I'm not trying to diminish anything someone is going through today. I'm not trying to diminish anything that you're dealing with today. But think about whatever you're going through. And there may be some. I have seen God do it. I recently situation where someone we prayed with uh, received a 50 
year miracle. They said they've been waiting for 50 years for this miracle. So I've seen God do greater. But within the context of this 38 years, think about what where this guy's mentality must have been. And Jesus walks up to him, and the Bible says, uh, John records that Jesus knew, he understood that this guy had been like this for a long time. Jesus even recognized that. So that tells me that Jesus is aware of where you're at. Jesus is not some far off distant God that is to be worshiped in some kind of temple that has no kind of connection to where you are. And you've got to go to God and say, okay, God, um, by the way, I just want to let you know uh, that my life is really tough right now. God, I just want to let you know that, uh, um, um, you know, I'm really going through some stuff right now. In fact, the Bible says he knows what you need before you even ask. He already knows it. He knows where you're at. Now, I know that lends us to another question. The question is, well, if he knows where I'm at, why does he leave me where I'm at? And I think we're going to get to that question in just a minute. But the fact of the matter is we can acknowledge something today. We can establish something today. And the fact is that God knows exactly where you're at. Now, you can accept that, and it could bring faith. It could bring, okay, all right, God knows where I'm at. All right, that's great. Or it could go the other way. We're like, well, God knows where I'm at. Well, great. If he knows where I'm at, I'm really... You know, this stinks because look where I'm at. And if God knows where I'm at, then what kind of God is he that he's left me where I'm at? We're going to get to that in just a minute. So you can go both ways with that statement that uh, God knows where I'm at. Well, he does know where you're at. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus walked up to this man and said to him, Hey, uh, I realize where you've been. But then Jesus asked this question that is just absolutely staggering in its just somewhat magnitude, but also in almost somewhat ignorance, if you look at it from one perspective. Because Jesus walks into this situation. I want you to, let's paint a picture for a second. Uh, let's get into the story. I, that's how I operate when I, when I read the Bible. I try to create the story in my head. I'm not saying it's always accurate, it's my interpretation of what it must have been like. But it kind of helps me visualize uh, things. So I, I got to imagine Jesus walks up to this guy. He's sitting there. And um, in whatever the situation is, he, he said he had to be carried to the pool. So it was something at least going on with his lower body. He had some kind of issue with his lower extremity. So whether or not his feet were withered or his leg or broke, whatever it might be, he had some serious issues going on with his lower body. And Jesus walks up to him, and it's obvious where the man's at. It's obvious he's hanging out at this pool that has these magic powers to heal. And it's obviously that this guy had been there a long time because Jesus even recognized he had been there a long time. And then Jesus asked him what seemed to be the dumbest question you'd ever ask anybody in the history of all mankind. It seems like it's the dumbest question. I mean, come on, Jesus. Are you, are you, you, do you not realize what you're asking? He asked this guy such a crazy question. He says to this guy who's sitting in that situation, would you like to get well? Would you like to get well? What kind of question is that? I mean, you look at that question on one standpoint, and you just kind of, you know, it's that Palm to the face emoji. Everyone's used it, right? You got that little guy with the palm to the face. It's this emoji. If we could write an emoji into John's gospel, I would go with the palm to the face emoji because it's kind of like, uh, Jesus, do you really know what you just asked this guy? Because, of course, like all of, uh, uh, like, 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 what we normally do, we read things from a surface level. We read things based off what we can see about what the information we can take in. So we're reading the story, and if we had just stopped here, we look at the story and go, Jesus has just absolutely insulted this man. I mean, it's like walking up into the oncology department today at the local hospital and walking around to people and um, asking them, uh, do you want a cure for your cancer? Or walking into the ICU today and asking people, uh, do you want to be healed? You would go, uh, excuse me, sir, get out. 
Because you're the most insensitive person I've ever met. And I'd say, well, I want to know if they want to be healed. And the obvious question to that answer should be, of course they want to do. Who wants to volunteer to have a disease? Who wants to volunteer to go through something like chemo or radiation? Who, who, no one chooses to do that. I remember watching my mother who dealt with uh, breast cancer. And she was dealing with breast cancer for the third time uh, several years ago. And my wife and I and, and my children got to go with her on the day she got to ring the bell. Her final day of chemo, uh, she got this, the ring the bell ceremony. We got to stand out there with, uh, with my mom, my wife, and my three kids. They were a little younger at the time. And we got to all sit there and everybody clapped because she had completed her, uh, her, um, her, uh, Radi or a chemo treatment. But that'd be like me walking into the room with my mother as she is sitting there receiving chemo and, and she's going through the effects that chemo is having on her body and, and all the stuff that chemo does. And I don't want to get into that. If you know anything about chemo, you know exactly what it does. But it's like me walking into the room and saying, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Mrs. Wright, uh, do you want to be healed? I'm sure if I ask her that in the middle of sitting there with, with chemo being administered to her, and I said, excuse me, uh, do you want to be healed? If she had the strength, I'd imagine she'd probably just reached up and smacked me across the head. Say, are you serious? I'm not suggesting my mom would hit me, but I'm just simply saying, I think that's how ludicrous that question is. Are you serious? Because that's how we are. Uh, of course. Of course I want to be you know, if I ask you today, do you really want to change? Do you really want to be different? Do you really want Jesus to change your life? Do you really want Jesus to make you whole? Do you really want Jesus to put the pieces of your life back together again? Do you really want Jesus to help you overcome your depression? Do you want Jesus to help you overcome your fear and anxiety and worry? Do you want Jesus to be your peace and your joy and happiness? Do you want Jesus to be the center of your life? Do you want Jesus to heal your broken heart? Do you want Jesus to heal your marriage? Do you want Jesus to heal the wounds of shame and things that happen? Do you want Jesus to heal the hurt from the abuse that you dealt with, the, 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 the abuse that you had done to you when you were a child, the abuse you were at the hands of your husband or your wife, the abuse you had at, at the hands of a family member? Do you really want Jesus to help you with that? If I ask you that question this morning, most of you would respond either two ways. One would respond, yes, I want that. And second, a lot of you would respond with some sort of offense that I would even ask such a insulting question. And you would say to me, how in the world, why would you ask me a question? Do, do you think I volunteer to be abused? Do you think I volunteer to, to deal with the loss of my parent when I was a kid? Do you really think I would, that I really wanted to deal with losing a spouse or losing a child or losing this or losing that? Do you really want, think I really wanted to have a broken dream or a shattered life? Or do you think I really wanted to end up addicted to this pill or addicted to this bottle or addicted to this? And do you really want to think I, this is the way I, I dreamed my life to be? Why would you ask me such an insult? question because shouldn't it be obvious what the answer would be if I said to you Dave do you really want to change do you really want life to be different you would think the obvious answer would be a resounding immediate and exuberant yes of course I do that's the obvious thing right that's the thing that should be the answer that's the answer that should be Immediate. There shouldn't even be a hesitation. 38 years of being in a condition where you have your life surrounded by basically this pool where you're hoping one day you can get a touch of the magic waters, but you don't have the ability at this point and you've given up hope. Now, the reality of it is, is that now you're living for 38 years and you have this guy walk up to you and ask you this question, do you really want to be healed? You would think the first answer he would give, the quick response he would, would, would say would be, yes! Or even if he got a little irritated, he would, you know, the response should have been, are you kidding me? You think I just want to stay here after, you know, because I just like hanging out here? Do you really want to think I want to see people walk by, going about their life, living their life, being being married, being having kids, having a career, living life, you know, 
being able to, to to enjoy life and you think this is my this is what I this is the lot I chose yeah because I love hanging out by the sheep gate listening to the sheep pass by smelling the smell of sheep walking by I love this and both by the way I just I just adore hanging out here by the pool of Bethesda you know it's kind of like a vacation every day you know what I mean got my little chair you know little cabana boy bring me some drinks that's my life are you kidding me you really think I want to be here and of course uh, by the way, I've been here for 38 years. But Jesus asks him the question, would you like to get well? The answer should have been yes. But his answer wasn't yes. Your answer today, if I said to you, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be changed? Do you want to be delivered? Do you want to have peace? Do you want to have joy? Do you want to have a life? Do you want to have all you fill in the blank? Your answer should be immediately yes. But I've been doing this a long time. I've talked to many people in many different conditions. And I will tell you that the this verse is so real and so true because the answer should be yes, but that's not always the answer that comes out. Because Jesus says to him, do you want to be, would you like to get well? And he says, I can't. I can't. I'm not sure who it was. I think it was Henry Ford. I'm not sure. I think that's who was, who was the one that said it. I, I may be incorrect on that, so don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure it was Henry Ford that said, whether you can or you can't, you're right. Whether you can or you can't, you're right. And basically, this guy says, I can't. I can't. And he says to him, he continues, and then he elaborates on the reason why he says, he says, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone always gets there ahead of me. So he's, Jesus is asking him this question. Do you want to be well? Notice that there's no attempt by Jesus to judge the man's worthiness or even his faith level. Jesus is trying to get to one thing. Are you willing? And he responds, but my condition's not my fault. That's not the issue. Are you willing? But you don't know how long I've been here. You don't know how long I've felt this way. You don't know long how long I've lived with that. That's not the issue. Are you willing? But you don't know why, I, why I, you don't, no, that's not the issue. Are you willing? Do you really want to be well? Are you willing? Don't tell me what you can't do. I'm trying to tell you what I can do. But I can't overcome your can't until you acknowledge the fact that, yes, I want to change. If I said to you today, do you want to change? You say, well, I can't. You don't know how many times I've tried. You don't know how many times I've tried to change this. You don't, have, you don't know what I've tried to overcome my depression. You don't know what I've tried to come to overcome my pain. You don't know what I've tried to overcome. Okay, I'm not asking. I'm not asking what you've tried up to this point. I'm not even asking, have you tried? What have you tried? I, I, to me, that's between you and God. I'm not asking what you've tried. I'm just asking you, do you want to be well? See, the problem with this guy, which is really the problem we have a lot about, a lot of us is, is that he wanted the ease of life but the blessing of deliverance. He wanted the ease of life, but the blessing of deliverance. 38 years of living life, and we presume, we don't know this, but it has this sort of presumption to it. I will say it this way. It's a presumption that he had been coming to this pool for a long time. I don't know if it was the full 38 years or it had been a while, but he had been coming a long time. And what's crazy is, is that he wanted the ease of life, but the blessing of deliverance. And how do I know that? It's because of this. After 38 years, he found the best place to live and to stay was up underneath the porches. Because he says to Jesus, I can't. 
because while I'm coming, someone else steps in the water or I have no man to carry me into the water. That connotates that he had made a separation from the water's edge to more up underneath the porches. There was coverings around these pools and it kept the sun from beating down, the rain from hitting you. So basically what he's saying is, is that I've given up hope of changing, so now I'm just trying to make the best of the situation. I, I, I'm just trying to make, and I'll use the good word we all use right now, especially this is the, one, of the, one of our COVID 2020 words. I'm just trying to find a new normal. That's, our, that's one of the words, you know, we all, I've said that. You know, what's the new normal gonna be? Because we'll never go back to the way things were before March, 2020. Uh, you know, those days are gone in some ways. Yeah, we might go back to a lot of things, but there's some things that will never go away. Kind of like uh, air travel pre 9-11 and post 9-11. Uh, it's never been the same, even though, yeah, that's, it's normal to me now. I've, you know, after, uh, you know, 20, almost 20 years of traveling post 9-11, uh, yeah, it's normal to you to go and get scanned and get checked and go through all the security protocols that are in place now for travelers. Uh, but that's not the way it was before 9-11. It's the same way it's going to be with us and COVID. There's going to be some things that never go back to the way they were March, pre-March 2020. There's some things that will forever change. There are probably things in the healthcare industry, in the way you know some of you work, some of you have been working from home and probably will never go back to an office full time ever again. There's some things that will never change. And so because of that, we have made the statement, well, we're trying to adjust to a new normal. What's the new normal? I gotta find the new normal. And you know what's amazing is I'm sure this guy started off with a place right next to the water's edge. But as time um, slipped by, he began to adjust to a new normal. He began to adjust to the surroundings and make them normal. And so by the time Jesus gets to him, Jesus is not looking at his condition. Jesus is not judging how long he's been there. Jesus is trying to ask him, do you want to be well? Because by that point, Jesus discerned that this guy had made a new normal out of this situation. You see, the problem is normal as a definition is an environment you become comfortable with, you're settled in. That's one of the definitions of normal. But the problem with normal is, normal is, is subjective. There's a lot of things that I would say that aren't normal that begin to feel normal to you. There are some things about life that you talk to some people and it's so normal to them. They've lived with this situation or they've been in this situation and they've Gone, they've gone through situations uh, uh, and they've dealt with certain things that to me doesn't seem normal, but to them it's normal. So normal is subjective. And, and then we start to use certain ways to frame our, our own understanding of normal. We, we make statements like, well, this is the way it's always, this is the way it's been. This is the way it's always going to be. Or you know what? I, I've just learned how to get by. That's another good way. That's just another way of saying that I've settled that this is my normal. I've learned how to just got, get by. Or about this one, ready? Here's another good one. This is my lot in life. This is just my lot in life. These are the cards I've been dealt. This is the way it's been. And we start to define our normal by these words and we, we phrase them in ways to kind of ease our own suffering and kind of bring some kind of clarity and justification to where we are by saying the way that, well, this is the way it's been. Or, you know, my parents suffered through this and so therefore, you know, it's normal that I, I go through the same thing they go through. And, you know, it, well, my, my dad my dad had struggled with this, so, you know, of course I struggled with that. Or my mom was like this, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be like that. Or, or, you know, just, you know, some people just have to learn to get by. Some people just, that's what, you know, we just, you learn to survive. 
You know, how are you doing? Well, I'm, you know, I'm surviving. That's just a way of saying, well, I've adjusted to the, to the normalcy of the fact that my life stinks, but this is the way it's going to be. So I'm trying to make the best of it. And then again, you know, when we finally get to this place of complete acceptance, we just come to the words, well, this is just my lot in life. You know, I'm just, I'm just one of those people that are never going to be happy. I'm just one of those people that I probably will never have peace. I'll, I'll never have, I'll never have uh, a happy family. I'll never have a good marriage. I'll never have fulfillment in life. I'll never be able to, uh, to have a day where I can have peace in my mind and peace in my heart. And I can never have a day where, where, where I don't have to live with this depression or this hole in my heart. It's just the way it is. It's my lot in life. Or another way to say that, you know, this is my cross to bear. And this is where that guy had gotten into. So now we're understanding a little bit when we start to dive deeper in the situation that Jesus's question wasn't exactly off the wall. Jesus's question wasn't exactly so insulting because Jesus wasn't looking at his condition. Jesus was looking at the entire picture and Jesus was noticing something here. Wait a minute. You say this pool can heal, but yet you have determined to live your life here. And then when I ask you, do you want to be healed? Your response was to me is, you can't? You can't? I mean, think about this right now. Think about if you were in a condition for 38 years and you knew that the answer, there was a legitimately tangible answer before you. Wouldn't you think you would do everything in your power to crawl, to, to, to dig your way to get that answer? And think about the, to the links people will go to find a cure for something. Think about the things, the stuff people will put into their bodies, will drink, the pills they'll take. I mean, come on, we've joked about it. You've joked about it. It's a joke. It's something that we make fun of. But think about it. You go on and you, you see a, a commercial on television that is going to take care of something, whatever that might be. Anxiety, depression, or other stuff. There's tons of pills out there. And it cures one thing, but at the end of the commercial, it's always the guy that talks really fast. And it says, well, by the way, potential side effects are... We don't even hear that stuff. We don't even pay attention to it. We do. We acknowledge that, but we don't even stop to realize this. You know, potential this could be you know, heart problems, you know, suicide, all, I mean, just crazy stuff that could come from taking it. But we're so desperate to find an answer for our condition that we're willing to take the risk. We're willing to reach the risk of, okay, we know that there's risk. I mean, if you've had surgery before and you've ever had that, had that doctor sit down with you and tell you before it's surgery, okay, Mr. Wright, we're going to fix this. However, here is the chances that these things could go wrong. I had, years ago, I had uh, reconstructive surgery on my hip. There was a bunch of stuff going on, on my hip and the doctor was trying to save it that I didn't have to have a hip replacement. And so he began to, and he said, you know, here's some things that could possibly go wrong. And one of those was, oh, by the way, your hip may never work again. And we may have to do a hip replacement anyways. To be honest with you, I heard those words. Okay, but you know what? Let's do the surgery. I'm okay, doc. I got it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do the surgery. You know what? I was willing to take the risk of what could happen for the sake of what could, what, what may happen for what the positive over here. I was willing to take the possibility of the negative for the positive on this side. You know what's amazing about that? We have no problem. Most of us, I'll put it that way, there's probably one or two of you that are very cautious and God bless you. But most of us, when we go to take, I mean, look at the warning labels on the back of the stuff we take. Even Advil, Tylenol, they have warning labels that if you use this product in a certain, certain way, certain way, certain way, these things can happen to you. They're on there for a reason. They're on there because someone has had something happen to him. Or them. I mean, was it uh, baby powder? What was it? Talcum powder? What? There was some kind of powder. I don't remember the whole story. I know some of you are probably going to light it up on the comment section. Let me know what it was. But there was a powder recently, some kind of powder that uh, it was uh, 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 Johnson and Johnson or or, or some other uh, Procter and Gamble, one of the big companies. They just had a massive, 
huge lawsuit lost because this powder caused cancer. And it was won in a big court case, a huge settlement. And they've taken that product off the, the shelf. It's amazing the stuff that we're willing to take for a natural standpoint. We got pain, give me the, you know, give me this stuff. I'll, you know, some of the pain medication that they give you that has those massive warning labels about, by the way, don't drive, don't, don't take this and, and operate a car. Oh, by the way, don't, don't take this and have alcohol in your system because here's the things that could really go bad if you have these these pills, because these pills are gonna fix something, but they come with a very high risk. But yet, we take them. We take those surgeries, we do those things. We're, we're willing to take those things. We'll take a pill, we'll, we'll ingest something in our body. We'll, we'll, we'll let the doctor treat us. We'll, we'll go through the, go through. I mean, think about the, what happens when you go through radiation or chemo or these terrible things that some of you have had to walk through because of things that are happening in your body and we do those things and 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 thankfully all, wonderfully blessed with the medical community because in a lot of ways they save and extend our life and we have such a long uh, expected life rate because of all these advances but but they come with their inherent risk but what's amazing is when it comes to God we want God to eliminate all the risks you know uh do you want to be well well yeah God I'll be well but you gotta guarantee me that I'm actually gonna, it's gonna happen. Because you know what, I'm not willing to believe you and that it not happen because I don't wanna be disappointed. But yet you go to your doctor tomorrow and he says, here, take this pill. You don't ask that doctor, doc, are you sure this is gonna work? What if it doesn't work? You usually say, okay, doc, I'll try it. And the doctor says, well, if it doesn't work, you know, come back, we'll try something else. No problem, I'll try it. We're willing to take the risk when it comes to the medical field because we know, and I'm not knocking doctors or, or any of the medical field, but come on, folks, they, some of them, they're flying blind. I remember I had this situation going on with, the, with something in my body, and I went to the doctors, and this medical doctor who had 30 years of experience, very good doctor, well-trained, well-educated, he looked at me and said to me, to my face, these inspiring words. He says, I have no idea what that is. And you know what's funny? Didn't offer a solution. Did, he just basically said, you know what? I have no idea what that is. And he said, here, try this and see if this helps. I was like, all right, thank you for that copay I just spent. 30, whatever, what, I don't even know what the copay was, but I basically paid my money and pay my insurance premium so I can have a doctor look at me in the eye and say, really, you know, son, I don't really know what that is. Thanks, doc, I appreciate that. So there's great doctors out there. Some of you may work for a doctor. You may be a great doctor. In fact, we have an awesome doctor that watches us most Sundays. Dr. Mitchie, if you're walk watching, you're the best. We love you. But bottom line is this. Doctors don't know everything. But yet we're willing to take the risk with what they say because we're willing to find the cure. But when it comes to God, we want God to eliminate all the risks. We want God to make it easy. We want God to take it away. And this guy says, hey, by the way, um, do you want to be healed? And his excuse was, I can't because, you know, I don't have anyone to take me down to the pool. I, I, have, nobody, I have nobody to carry me. The pool gets troubled. The pool is... Uh, is 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 too far out of reach. I, I, I've learned to adjust to where I'm at. Yeah, do I want to be healed? Sure, but you know, I don't know. I I don't know. You know, my life stinks, but it is life. And it's amazing this. Jesus did not say to him, "Oh, by the way, all right, fine. Let, here, let me help you to the pool." Jesus looked at him from where he was at and said to him, get up. Stand up. Pick up your mat. Stand up. Pick up your hat, mat. And what? Walk. Now, I want you to get this for a second because uh, I want you to see his surroundings. This guy is surrounded by people in the same condition. This pool was extremely crowded. In fact, I want to get too detailed here, but I, I just, this is interesting, especially those of you that really like to study the Bible. 
There is a great consensus of argument among theologians that John chapter 5, verse number 4, was not in the original uh, Greek manuscript of the Gospel of John. John chapter 4 says there was an angel that came and troubled the water. And when the angel troubled the water, that uh, the first person in the water would be healed. That's what the what John says. But that's what the King James Version and other versions of the Bible say. Notice this, and I want to get too technical, but I want to make this point, is that the Bible that we read today, whether it's the King James Version or one other version that you like, whether it's uh, one of the modern translations, they are just that. They are translations. They are not the original text. The original text was Greek and Hebrew. Greek for the New, Hebrew for the Old Testament. So the original texts are uh, the only truly inspired Word of God. Some, have, some people have made the King James Bible out to be the true inspired Word of God. But the King James Bible was an Anglican Bible that was commissioned by the Anglican Church of England. And actually, it's very easy to show that the Anglican Bible, which is the King James Bible, had some things in it that were changed out of the original manuscript to fit the Anglican belief. I'm not knocking any of this. I'm just trying to make a point. So there is this argument that John chapter 5, verse 4 from the story, if you notice when I read it, I didn't even read the verse 4. I kept that out because there's a strong consensus that that angel troubling the water was not uh, something that was um, uh, was, uh, was actually an angel, that, that that was actually added years later to try to explain what this was because after unearthing some things in that area they found the area where the pool of bethesda was and they have discovered that nearby there was a greek temple a greek shrine that this place had become uh, this pool had become a healing shrine that even the greeks when alexander the great came and conquered the palestine area and jerusalem um, and then later the romans took over that the greeks had even created this and knew this place had medicinal powers healing powers that happened all over the ancient world there was places that had deemed to be and that there was this pool that this pool had become the place known as the healing shrine. Because it's quite interesting if you look at that, it does kind of bring to question that there was an angel that troubled the water and it was kind of like a lottery. Who fell in the water first? God doesn't really operate like that. And when you think about it from that context, the context of the way God operates, that really doesn't make sense that literally the, the angel would come and hover, touch the water, and it would be like this just freeding frenzy. And like, you know, kind of like the Olympics. Mike, remember Mike, that, that race with Michael Phelps? Anybody like watch the Olympics? And Michael Phelps in his one of his last races in the Olympics, I mean, he's going and literally they show the replay and his hand touched. I mean, it was like one one thousandth of a second before the other guy and Michael Phelps won the gold medal. You know, did, 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 did the angel touch the water and, and you know, was it the first person, was it your clothes, whoever's clothes touched the water or was it had to be a body part? And like, is there some kind of special mechanism that determined like, oh, you were so close. You were one one thousandth of a second away from being healed today. I'm sorry, wait your turn. So I, I even question the validity of the fact that it really was an angel because God, from all I know about God, God doesn't operate like that. In fact, so many times we find that Jesus healed them all. God touched them all. Were there times God singled out an individual? Yes, but it was because of the individual's faith or something about that individual that drew Jesus' attention. But most of the time, God treats us all the same. So it's hard to me to believe that this angel comes down, touches the water, and it's like this freeding frenzy, and it's like the Olympic race of, of, all, of epic proportions. And so... This, this pool had been made into this sort of healing shrine. And because you know what? It's very funny. What's amazing about the Bible is this. And I'm almost done. I'm just trying to make these last few points before we find the finish line here today. And it's this, is that the, the reason why the Bible is so amazing, even after thousands of years, is that the Bible, even though it was written within the context of uh, the first century, and it's written in the context of even BC, 
that it is a book about humanity more than anything. Yes, it's a book about God, his nature, his principles, how God is, how God operates. But it's also a book about human nature. That's why today, even 2,000 years later, the Bible is so real because the Bible is about human nature. And you know what? Humans haven't changed. We may have evolved to be a little taller, stronger, faster, more intellectually proficient. We have more advancements than ever before, but there's still a part of human nature that's been the same for thousands of years. That's why the Bible may not describe the current world we live in, but it describes how humans operate because humans have been the same. And this guy, even though there's no magic pool around, there's still people today that, why do you think infomercials are made? Even though you know those infomercials don't really work. Take this medicine, take this pill, do this, do that. Call now. And if you call now, but in the next 30 seconds, we will give you an extra bottle for free. Now, do it quickly. Operators are standing by and you're like, oh my goodness, I got a call. This is my, this is my answer. Why? Because we're still looking for that answer today. But I want you to imagine this pool, this healing shrine, this place that whether it was real or not, they had believed that this place had healing powers. But yet this pool had become so crowded with people that this guy was even back behind, had moved his way back. It was a place of frustration. It was a place of dashed hopes, dashed dreams, broken, broken hearts to where it got to the point where it was literally where people just sat back and just went, wow, I wish I was them today. Oh man, look at, look, Johnny got in there. Oh, Sally made it. Good job, Rebecca, you did it today. Oh, that's it, Jacob, you just made it in there. Way to go, buddy. What a place of frustration. And in that place of frustration, Jesus walked in. Jesus. And he walks over to one of the most senior members of the, of the fraternity. He walks over to the most senior member, one of the most senior members of the Pool of Bethesda fraternity. And walks over to him and says, you know what your problem is? Do you really want to be well? The problem to you today is not do you want to be well. The problem is you've made choices. And I'm asking you, do you want to change your choice? You've made choices. You know the problem sometimes with certain conditions in our life? They're a great excuse. Look at this for a second. Even though the answer seems so obvious, I want you to consider this. The man had not asked Jesus for help. He didn't call and say, oh, hey, isn't that guy Jesus? Everywhere Jesus went, the crowd buzzed with anticipation. But he didn't say Jesus. Jesus went to him. Because you know what? There's part of it that in that day, you could actually live somewhat of a profitable life, somewhat of a decent living, by playing the victim card, sitting by the, by the side of the road with your cup. There were many people, especially Pharisees, that would give to those people. Now, they would do it not out of love, but they would do it out of a responsibility and sort of their own uh, religious um, uh, 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 exploits to grow their religious fame. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the problem he had to do is if he was going to change, he was going to have to lose his victim mentality. That, that, that's kind of what Jesus was getting at. Do you want to be well? If you want to be well, you might have to change and give up your current excuse and your victim mentality. Because what was his words to Jesus? I can't. The problem is, there's nobody to carry me into the water. Jesus recognized something, that his focus was completely wrong. 
you know, the, the big issue is, and really the unspoken question that Jesus has, is that if you want to be well, you're going to have to be willing to pay a price to be well. Because you know what? There's benefits to having the illness that you've got. You've got an excuse. Well, you know, I can't be a part. I can't. I've got this. I've got that. I can't really. I, but God, I, it's going to cost you to be well. You're going to have to lose your excuse. Because you know what? The man by the pool, he didn't have to work. Didn't have to, uh, didn't have to get up and do certain things. He had someone to carry him. He had someone to bring him food. He didn't have to do anything. Some other perks that may have been there for him. That after a while, in order to change, he'd have to lose some of those perks. So Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? He was asking him, this is going to cost you. My healing does not come free. You don't have to earn it, but it's going to cost you something. Because your thinking and your acceptance of your current situation is the reason why you're still here. Because instead of offering Jesus faith, he offered Jesus an excuse. You know what? This is the way it is. This is the way it is. Nobody cares about me. Oh, I don't have family here anymore. I don't have any friends. I have nobody that loves me anymore. I don't even have people. I don't even have a church family that can help me get to the water. I'm just the way it is. You know, I've been sitting here watching these special meetings happen where people get healed and I, I have to sit here and watch it happen. And Jesus knows exactly the problem. It's his focus. It's where his head is. It's what he's looking at. He's got the healer standing in front of him, but yet he's too busy looking at his surroundings and using all the excuses around him. It was almost like he was looking at Jesus and Jesus said, do you want to be healed? And he was like, yeah, I can't. Oh, oh by the way, could you move over a little to the right? I can't see the pool. I, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be able to get there today because I, I know, you know, more than likely someone's going to beat me to the punch. But but if you could possibly, uh, would you would you move over to the side? I want to see if someone's going to get healed today. It's been a couple of days since um, since someone's been healed, and uh, uh, I just want to I want to be here in case it happens. I you know I can't make it anymore. No one's going to carry me. They, I'm just an old guy now. But you know, there's a new a new a new kid that just showed up. I guarantee you that kid. He's, he's, he's full of energy. He's going to be the one. Let's just watch and see what happens. And Jesus is like, are you serious? Are you serious? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the healer. And Jesus looks at him and says something almost equally as crazy as his first question. He looked at the guy. Didn't ask him, do you believe? Didn't ask the guy anything. He didn't even respond to the excuse. He says to the guy, do you want to be well? And the guy gives him, but I can't. And Jesus comes back, didn't even respond to that. He says, all right, here we go. Stand up. Get your cot and walk. Now, I know when you hear that, and again, work with me for just five more minutes here. I'm done. I imagine when you hear that, I, I get the I get the Hollywood version of that of that. I get the Hollywood version where it's like uh, you know you know the 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 no moment where like Jesus uh, says to him, stand up, take up your 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 mat and walk, and it's like Mwah! and the guy kind of like lifts up like na 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 na. I mean, angels are blowing trumpets, everyone's cheering. That's it, John. That's it, John. You got it, buddy. Where to go, Jeremiah? Everybody, Jeremiah, thirty-eight years. Yes, the crowd's going. Ah. They're chanting, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's kind of the version of that I think, but I don't think it happened like that. Because I think Jesus looked at this guy and said, stand up, get your mat, and walk. And that guy went, are you serious? <laughs> what? You want me to? Do you not see the condition of my legs? Are you blind? Do you... I don't even have someone to carry me to the pool. And I'll emphasize again the word carried because these fellows don't work. Um, in case you don't recognize this, I'm not here um, because, you know, this is a, a vacation for me. These puppies don't work, and I have to be carried to the pool. What part of carry don't you understand? And you're telling me to stand up? Are you crazy? Now, if you want to help me up, I'll give it a shot, but you're going to have to do the work. You start pulling, and I'll, I'll see what happens. 
No, no, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't reach down and go, okay, here, grab my hand. And Jesus yanks at him and pulls him up. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said to him something. He asked him to do something the man hadn't done in 38 years. He asked him to do something. Stand up. You know what Jesus was doing? He just said, give me something to work with. Okay, you give me excuses, but I can't heal you unless something changes. So I'm going to give you a chance. Stand up, get your cot, and walk. And basically, Jesus was saying, if you give me something to work with, I, could, I can change your life. You know the problem with today? God's not going to come down and hand, give you a hand and start pulling you up. Oh, that's it. Go, okay, God, I heal me. Pull me. Come on. I, don't want, I, I, I can't do it, God. You know how bad my life is right now. You know how difficult it is. But if you would just reach your hand down right here on my poor little earth, you'd reach your big, strong hand out of heaven. You start pulling. I'll be okay. Okay, God, hurry up. Pull, pull, pull. God says to him, you know what? I want you to do something you don't believe you can do, but give me something to work with. I don't know how long it must have happened. I guarantee you it wasn't quick. But I guarantee you that guy was like, are you serious? Stand up. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. I haven't done that in 38 years. So you know, I'll be right on that. Because by that time, his... His, his muscles had to have been shrunk. His legs were probably shriveled. His, his muscles were in ap, ap, atrophy. They were completely useless. And he's asking this guy to do something. But somewhere, I don't know if he adjusted. I don't know if he began to push with his, with his hands. I don't know if he grabbed a hold of the rail next to him and began to push. But somewhere in this of attempting to do something, Strength started to come. And the more he pushed, the stronger he got to the point where he was able to stand, get his bed, and walk away from that pool after 38 years. Can I tell you, give God something to work with today. God's asking you today, do you want to be healed? And you're telling him yes. But then he turns to you and says, good, stand up, take up your bed, and walk. And you go, but I don't know if I can do that. I'm asking you, activate your faith. Give God something to work with. Get up tomorrow morning and say, God, you're a healer. You're a deliverer. I don't feel delivered. I don't feel healed. I don't feel changed. You're right. That guy did not feel it the moment. It Notice the healing happened after he moved, not before he moved. It happened after he moved. You might have to get up in the morning and say, I believe you're a healer. I believe you're a deliverer. I believe you can do it. And not feel it, but speak it with faith. And when you speak with faith, God goes, yes, I got something to work with. If you're, if you're today and you have no clue who Jesus is and you don't even know where to start, just start by simply going, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I acknowledge my way doesn't work. My way has failed. But God, I need you. And you know what you're going to find when, when you say that Jesus is going to go, yes, now you're giving me something to work with. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, you're giving me something to work with. I can't work with nothing. But if you give me something, if it's a grain of a mustard seed, just give me something to work with. If it's just a little bit, give me five loaves and two fishes, I'll feed 5,000. Give me a grain of a mustard seed and I'll move a mountain. Just give me something to work with. Don't give me what you can't do. Give me what you can do. But I can't get to the pool. But I can say, Jesus, heal me. I can't get to the pool. My legs don't work. But I can say, you know what? I'll try to stand up. Don't tell God what you can't do. God wanting to know what you can do. Oh, I can't change my life. You're right. But I can lift my hands today and say, God, I love you. I need you. I can't make it without you. God, I've got to have you. My life's a mess. My marriage is a mess. My family's a mess. My heart's a mess. I'm depressed. I'm full of worry, anxiety, fear, pain, fill in the blank. God, I need you. Give God something to work. He's just asking you to give him something to work with. Get up. Get up. You know what God's telling someone today? Get up, but God, I can't. 
I'm not asking you what you can do. I'm asking you what you can do. But I can't. I haven't got up in 38 years. You're right. You can't do it. But if you start moving, you're going to give me something to work with. I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can move past this fear. I can move past this depression. I can move past this heartache. I can move past all of this. Do I feel it the moment I say that? Absolutely not. But I'm going to give God something to work with. Instead of giving God my can'ts, I'm going to speak to God and give him my cans. God, I can be healed. God, I can walk in faith. God, I can. I can because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. When I say I can, I'm not saying it's in Joel's power, but I'm acknowledging that I can do it in his power and I'm submitting to his command. He says, get up. I'm getting up. He's telling me to do something he knew I couldn't do. He told that guy to get up knowing that guy could not get up. But he asked him to get up anyways because he said, if you start moving, I have something to work with. Can I tell someone today, get moving and give God something to work with in Jesus' name. Father, I've spoken every word you've given me to speak to the best of my ability. I've not tried to add to or take it from, but I felt your I have felt your hand, your, your word penetrating through this camera that is speaking to someone's heart today. And you're telling them, stand up, stand up, stand up. And they've been arguing with me for the last hour saying, but I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. You don't know how long I've dealt with this. You don't know how bad it is. You don't know what I'm going through. And I know God, you're speaking to their heart today and you're telling them, yes, you can because it's not through your strength, but it's my strength. It's not by your ability, but it's through my ability. But you gotta give me something to work with. Father, I speak that faith would rise in our hearts today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let faith rise up today in Jesus' name. I lose faith to rise up in every heart that is watching this or will watch it today. Lord, that they would believe in you and they would see you as the source. They would not look at the surroundings, they would not look at the pool, but they would look to you who is the author and the finisher of the faith. And I pray now in Jesus' name that you would be revealed who you are, that we're not looking at the healing of the pool because we have the healer standing in front of us. We're not looking at the deliverance of the pool because we have the deliverer standing in front of us. Lord, open our eyes that we can see it's you. You're standing here. You're ready to do something. And God, it feels like you're asking me to do something that I can't do. But you're not asking me to do it on my own because you're standing there to guide me every step of the way. You just want me to take the first step. So today, Lord, show me what that first step is in my life. I don't know what it is, but God, you can show me what that step is. And Lord, when, I, when you show me that step, Lord, I receive your grace to step forward. Even though I can't stand, I'm going to try to stand. Even though I can't walk, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other because I know that if I give you to something to work with, you're able to do exceeding and abundantly above what I can ask or think. I speak these things in Jesus' name. I receive these things today in Jesus' name. I speak in faith, God, that the, the, the fruit of this word would come forth now in Jesus name. I bind depression and fear and anxiety. I bind everything that is keeping us bound and keeping us keeping us chained to our current situation and we are and we're 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 we 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 we're, we're imprisoned by addiction we're imprisoned by hurt and shame and i speak deliverance today in Jesus name. Be healed, be whole, be changed, be delivered, be free in Jesus name, not by your strength, but by the strength of the one and only Savior and healer and deliverer, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, let it be done today. God can do it, but you got to give him something to work with. Get up. Get up today in Jesus' name. And when you start standing, God will start working today. But you've got to give him something to work with. Don't say you can't. Tell God, I can. In Jesus' name.